All right, I'm ready to begin. Okay. How is everyone? I'm not writing code so, so I could tell you about linear models and classification. All right, I'm, a, I'm one of the core devs of scikit-learn, and I do that day to day. So, yeah. So let's talk about linear models for classification and also support vector machines. All right. Um, the all right, so last lecture you learned about class linear models for regression. So this class we're going to learn about classification in the binary sense and also in the multi-class sense. So the easiest thing to go through is the binary case. So you're, you're, you're trying to predict zeros and ones, but sometimes for the linear models and for SUMs, we like to encode them as ones and negative ones sometimes. So it's either one and zeros or one and negative ones. For these slides, it's going to be one and negative one. All right. So it's very, it's very small distinction, but very important. Um, so what do we mean by linear models for classification? Well, um, you have these points. Some of them are classified as positive, and some of them are negative. In this case, the red is positive. Um, if, if you look down, it's, it's almost like regression. You have the wt, which is um, x plus b, which is regression. But for classification, we, we take the sign to predict the positive or negative class. Um, so, if if you if anyone if anyone's familiar with multivariable calculus, like back in the undergraduate days, um, wt is just the normal vector of your plane. And in this case, since it's two dimensional, your hyperplane is just a line, the black line. Um, for in this case, the black line is equal to wt x plus b equal to zero. So this is because positive means um, positive class and negative means negative class. All right, so this is the, uh, yeah. So what else is there? So wt is the normal vector, and plus b gives you the, so if you don't have the plus b, it will all be intersect, it will all go through the zero, and so plus b shifts it away from the intersection. So it's very multivariable calculus. It's, we're not going to go into too much details about this, but yeah. Um, so the whole goal of classification is to find the WTs and Bs that separate these classes. That's the whole goal of this of um, classification for linear models. Okay, all right. Um, so how do we opt how do we find these things? Well, first we have to pick a loss. Um, so one of the there's a few loss functions. The one we really want is called the zero one loss, which is the yellow line. Um, where, so on the y-axis on the bottom, it's the probability of being positive, um, prob the probability of being in the positive class, the, the loss for the positive class, and on the bottom is w x, wt plus x plus b, which is very, I'm gonna say this a lot, w x, it's called the decision function. It's the thing you do before you take the sign. So th it's the thing inside the sign. Um, so if, in this case, since the y is the loss for predicting positive, um, if, you, if, your, if your decision function is positive, which is on, I could use mouse, I guess. Is it? Mouse? All right, so over here, the decision function is positive, so you have a zero loss. On, on this side, since your decision function is negative, it will predict negative class, which is wrong, so you have a positive loss, which is, this is one. So that's the zero, one loss. The thing about the yellow line is, is that it's not continuous, which makes it really hard to optimize. It's NP-hard. So in um, typical, typical machine learning fraction, we like to have a, we use another type of loss. We use, there's two different ones. There's the log loss, which is the curvy blue line. And then there's the hinge loss we'll talk about later. So this is very popular in um, neural networks. Um, who's familiar with neural networks? Just so, all right, cool. <laughs> um, so, the log loss is something that we're going to talk about right now, which is um, logistic regression. So the thing about the log loss is that it's convex, which makes it a very nice convex optimization problem. So it's very easy to optimize. Um, it's curvy, right? So, and so it's, it's differentiable, it's continuous, it's very nice. Um, the other cool things about this is that it pushes positive classes to the right. So because you don't want, so uh, you don't want if it pushes positive classes to the right, to the positive, yeah. Um, so if you look at the logistic regression, which is the, which uses the log loss, there's a lot of math here. It's, it's basically algebra at this point. Um, 
one way to think of logistic regression, the regression part of it, it comes from this piece, this WTX, WTX, WTX plus B. That's the regression part of it. And it's regressing over the log odds. Right, so um, you notice that I use one and negative one because this is the notation we use. This is, this is a common notation used in literature. Like if, if, and it makes, it makes the formula look nicer, slightly nicer. So that's why we use one and negative one. There's no, it's just, yeah, it just makes things look nicer. And um, it's the log of the ratio of the probability of one, which is the positive class, and divided by the probability of the negative class. Um, if you rearrange this, and, as, and you use that um, the sum of properties is one, you end up with this expression, right? This algebra. Um, the next expression is the, um, to optimize this, we want to maximize the, the log likelihood, which is the same as minimizing the, we want to maximize the probability of your seeing your data, and which is uh, maximizing the log likelihood. Um, we could take, it's very convenient numerically to take the log because um, logs are more well behaved than the, the probability, than pr multiplying tons of little probabilities. Logging it makes it more numerically stable. So we take the log and um, it's the negative log, but then if you do the algebra, like, like fully do the algebra, the negative goes away and it goes inside the log because um, negative log is just a reciprocal of the inside. So if you do the math, you end up with this expression. Right, there's, it's, it's, there's, it's just algebra at this point. All right, so the, um, the optimization problem for logistic regression is just minimizing that expression, that summation part. The sum, it's summing over the samples, okay? And, and, um, and then at the end, remember this whole goal is to figure out W and B. Once you have W and B, you can now make predictions. The W is your normal vector plus B is your intersect, and then you take the sign to get your classification. So that's the, that's the whole gist of logistic regression. <coughs> um, um, if, if you're familiar with this, that thing on the right, that's the sigmoid function. It's very popular in neural networks because it maps any real number to a number between 0 and 1, which is very, very nice. Because the WT, WTX plus B is any real number. Putting it through the sigmoid function makes it any, a number between zero and one, which is a probability. So it's very convenient when you want to model, what you want to transfer real numbers to a probability. So it's very commonly used in many applications. Every neural network, almost. Um, yeah, so that's all just a regression. Um, so now, one of, the popular, one of the ways to control the weights of your model, the Ws, is through regularization which is very similar that you w to what you saw in regression. Um, so you could have a squared, or um, the re regularization term is on, to, on the right. <laughs> um, it's, you, can, you can square it or you cannot, and it's the same type of idea that you saw in regression. The big difference is that in, regret, in, the, in the last class, um, you had an alpha, and that term was right here, right in front of the, w, the, um, the absolute value term. But Due to historical, because of history and how people develop SVMs, eh, um, they did the inverse and they put the regularization term on, on in the front of this term. All right, so it's this. So the C is, is analogous to one over alpha when you did ridge regression in the last class. Okay, so um, so th this means that bigger C's means. Um, less regularization, and smaller seeds mean more, more regularization. So it's the, it's the opposite logic. And what does that mean in the classification sense? Well, if you have bigger seeds, that means the law, the, um, you see how the left-hand turn, which is that big giant summation, that's where your data influences the loss. So if, the big, if you have a bigger seed, the more influence your points have on the loss, like by looking at the equation. So that means that um, you give more value to individual points. So this is very nicely demonstrated with an example, um, effects on regularization. Um, so you have, um, on the left-hand side, it's small c, and on the right-hand side, big c. Um, so for small c, which is a lot of regularization, which, um, <coughs> um, you see that we, we allow for points to be misclassified. Because, so uh, the decision balance is black, you see there's a blue point on the upper left, 
and then there's a red point on the bottom right, right on the bottom bottom. Um, as you increase increase C, which means you you increase the influence of your training points as you increase C to to 100, it, it makes it so that um, individual points have more influence. So it really wants to be very correct now because um, it really because you're over you're over you're weighing this bunch a lot more. So it really wants this line to be really correct. So this this line now is drawn in such a way that it, it's over. It's you could think of it as overfitting um, because because now that you it really wants the blue points to be on the bottom and the red points to be on the on the top. So it pushes it. It's like so bigger C, less regulation, and this is this is the general, this is the gist you get from C in this um, the formula. So that's yeah. So yeah, decision boundaries. Okay. So that's logistic regression, like a very quick overview. There's a lot of theory about logistic regression. We talk about how so there's many ways to solve this problem. We'll talk about that in a few slides. Um, <coughs> oh my god. <laughs> so what's next? Next would be support vector machines. Support vector machines. Um, how many have heard of support vector machines? How many of you have heard of log um, logistic regression? <laughs> okay, these things are very commonly used everywhere, like in industry, because people, they run quick, and they're, they're, it's a, it provides a very nice baseline. Just like, I think, probably Andreas mentioned this in the last class, they, you always train a logis, um, linear model on your theta because it provides, like if your model, if your new model doesn't do any better than a linear model, then what's the point? So you always train these models as a baseline for um, developing machine learning models. Um, yeah, so support vectors, let's, let's go to support vector machines. So support vector machines is um, almost the same as logistic regression. The only thing different is the loss function. Um, but to get a good gist of it, um, the point of a support vector machine is to draw a, bound, a, a boundary, but with a margin, right? And uh, as you can see here, um, if you want to separate the classes, um, you could, there's many different mi types of margins you can draw. There's like big, thick ones, like, I was gonna meme, but okay, there's big, um, <laughs> there's an orange one, and there's, this, there's a big orange one, which, ma so you wanna create the decision boundary that maximizes this margin, okay. yeah? Why, why would we use this instead of, or logistic regression instead of linear regression? Um, linear regression is reg a regression problem. This is for classification. Um, I'll go through why you want to use this instead of logistic regression. Uh, why even logistic instead of linear? Um, logistic, linear regression solves regression problems, and logistic regression solves the classification problem. Okay. Uh, yeah, so this also solves the classification problem. Um, the only thing different about this is that it uses different laws. Remember in the original slide, I had two loss functions, three loss functions, um, but two of them were log loss, very popular, and um, the other one was the hinge loss, which is this thing. Um, this, this notice the C is also on the summation. And now, the thing about this equation, like, you can see that the loss it's a maximum of two entities, zero and um, one minus yi, which is one or negative one, all right? And um, times the decision function. Um, wh what you get here is that if the right-hand side of the, of the max, max is positive, you're, you, 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 you contribute to the loss because it's a max. So if, if the one minus y, expression is negative, then the max is zero, then you don't contribute to the loss. So these points don't contribute to the loss. But if you look at the term that's within the margin, which is that, that inequality, um, then you contribute <laughs> to the loss. So these things that contribute to the loss are called support vectors, because well, I don't, I can't, I, because they support the model. <laughs> but um, yeah, so the, the thing about this is that the regularization term, the W, is important. Um, the smaller the w, which, is the, which you could think of as the normal vector, the bigger the margin. So if you look at, if you look at an example um, of changing c, um, if, if you look at the little line over here, 
this is c equals 0 0.1, which means that there is a, which means there's a lot of reg regularization and more. And um, if, and if you look at the circled points, I'm looking at two screens. So those are the support vectors. And you see that W is smaller than W here. This is the length of the normal vector. So the, small, the bigger the W, the smaller the margin in, in, this, in the support vector machine. Uh, okay, um, you see that as you increase C, there's less support vectors. Um, you, there's three in this case, and there's a lot more here. Um, that's because, um, for more, remember, for bigger C, your, your, your data points have more influence. And so it overweight, it puts a lot of weight on things like, like um, the, the, it puts a lot more weight on the points and so that it decreases the margin. There's, there's, there's many ways to look at this. There's, there's, if you read the literature, there's something called slack. There's so many ways to interpret these, like, these parameters. Um, <laughs> that's one of them. This is Andres' favorite way to do it. Is there buzzing? All right. Anyways. So um, if you look at the loss, it's important that, the, in this case, the, the regularization term, the absolute value w, it could be squared or not squared, just like you have in um, regular regression or logistic regression, L, so L1 norm and L2 norm both works. It's very important that there is regularization here in SVM, and in this case, linear SVM, um, because it bounds the, the value of w. Um, what, what I mean by that is that if, if there was no regularization term here, if this is not here, then um, the W could just grow to be however big you want, which decreases the margin, and the, this, this one is meaningless because you could, you, could just push the, you could push all the vectors to one side, and then you have like an infinite W, which doesn't make any sense. So this thing over here, to minimize this absolute value, bounds your values of W, which makes it a proper optimization problem. So this is, this is very important. It's always in the optimization problem for, for SVMs. Uh, let's not go too much into theory. Um, so if you look at, uh, what was there? If you look at the, um, the, the loss function for SVM logistic regression, if you compare them, the only thing different as if you compare them is just the loss function. So this is, it, it turns out Andres likes asking this as an interview question, like what's the difference between hinge loss and, um, and what's the difference between SVM and logistic regression, and this is the answer. So take notes. It, it's, it's, I'm going to tell it to everyone I know that does interviews that this, they should ask this question and be prepared, like at Amazon or why not. <laughs> Um, it's it's a, it's 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 very cool. I, I think it's, and yeah, and logistic regression is just a one layer neural network and yada yada yada. But yeah. anyways, <laughs> um, so so that now we went to two ways to do linear models for classification. So when do you use them? What's the point? Like wh why would you use SVMs? Why would you use logistic regression? Um, the biggest difference is that logistic regression by default has probability estimate, estimations, which is well calibrated which you learn about in two lectures, I, probably. So I, like, yes. <laughs> so it, because it gives you probabilities that are calibrated. And I won't go through what it means to be calibrated, but you, you learn about it soon. <laughs> um, if you don't care about the probabilities, if you don't care about the probabilities of um, your prediction, then it, it doesn't matter. You use either one, SVMs or um, logistic regression. If you think your data is sparse, that, as in the actual model doesn't care about all your parameters, then you use L1 loss because that makes those coefficients go to zero. So it's very standard type of thing. So that's linear models um, for lin linear models for binary classification. Right. So next is how do we extend this to multi-class classification? All right. So this this all this whole theory works for yeah everything we went to was bi um, binary classification. There's two ways to do multi-class classification. Um, they're both heuristics. So they, people do this because it, just, it works. Um, so there's two ways to do it. There's one versus rest, and there's one versus one. Okay. So in each case, you're, you're training multiple binary classification models. 
And um, let's go through one at a time. So let's look at one versus rest, which is the, usually the one that scikit-learn likes using, one versus rest. Um, so let's say you have four classes. Um, you would train four binary classification problems. You use all your data, you train four of them. Um, it would be one versus everything else, two versus everything else, so forth and so on. So therefore, one versus rest. Um, and you use all the data in this case. Now, so after you train these four bi um, binary classifiers, you have four decision functions, one, one for each class. What you do is you now predict the class is just get, you run through your four decision functions on your data. For, for each point in your, in your test set, you run the decision function through it, doing WTX plus B, and you just pick the one with the biggest. Um, decision function, the, the value for the decision function, then that would be your class. So it's very straightforward for um, one versus rest. Um, it, it works. People do this <laughs> a lot. Like it, when you learn about trees later, they do this in trees, and yeah. or in um, like UBM history and grading boosting trees, they do this too. Like it, 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 they do they, this this idea of doing one versus rest, very popular in machine learning. Okay. Um, if you look, um, here's an example of what one versus rest prediction looks like. In, in this case, there's three classes. So there's three lines. Each line represents a decision function equal to zero. Um, if you look at, if you look at, um, so remember the way you make a prediction is that you calculate the decision function, WTX plus B, and then for, the, in this case, three classes, and you pick the one with the biggest number. And um, if you do that in, in this two-dimensional space, you get these decision boundaries. So what is important about this is that, where's my last? Um, the W matters. The weight of your W matters in this case. Because in the middle, um, it's, if, if you think about the middle, all of them are saying that it's not that class. So you still do WT, WTX plus V on, three times, and then you pick the one with the big, they're all gonna be negative, but you, can pick, you pick the one with the biggest negative value in, in the center piece. So the, if you look at this line, so this gray line means that the top is positive, the bottom is negative, but as you move away, further away from this gray line, um, the WTX plus B is greater as you move further away from this line. And then if you go the other way, it becomes more negative. So you could do, yeah, so that's the gist of this idea of the decision function. Um, yeah, so that's one versus rest. Um, the more computational expensive one usually is the one versus one, where in this case you do, for every combination of classes you have, you do a binary classifier. So it's combinatoric, it's um, n, n number of classes choose two. So in this case, there's four classes, so n choose two, I mean, four choose two is six, so um, four, times three four times three divided by two, right? <laughs> So this would train that many classifiers, yeah, it says right here, and then um, how do you make a prediction in this case? You run through your test, your sample, through each one of these classifiers, and then whoever gets the most, so each one will have a vote on um, which class it could be, and the one that gets the most votes wins, and that's your class, right? That's one versus rest. Um, thing to know about this is <coughs> the thing to know about this is that this trains on subset of your data. Like this doesn't train on all your data because um, if you do one versus two, um, there are classes that are three and four that you're not going to use to train this binary classifier. Like if, if, you, if you're this, yeah, so it doesn't use all your data to train these binary classifiers because your data, your classes are either one, two, and three or four. So it uses a subset of your data. Okay, and again, it's a heuristic, yeah? Can you explain what the 1D2, 1D3, is this a different Yes, binary classifiers. So you have four classes and you train six classifi binary classifi classifiers. Um, Scikit-learn has wrappers to do this, one versus one classifier. Like, you could wrap um, estimators to do this for you. Um, by default, it does this one versus rest. It does a lot of, I'm gonna go through it later, but um, by default, we like using one versus rest. It's the more, it's like the thing we talked about here. Um, there are some classifiers that you could force it to do one versus one if you want, if it's applicable for your situation. 
Um, we're, I'll talk about that when we talk about scikit-learn and things. Um, so let's look at the picture for one versus, re one, versus one. So it's the same thing, you have decision boundaries. Um, in this case, it's, we have three classes again. Um, this, there's three decision boundaries, not beca because um, three times two divided by two is three. <laughs> So it's, it's, it's still doing the, um, so you end up with three anyways. So even though there's three classes, it's just, a, it's just how the math works out in this case, if you only have three classes. So you only get three decision boundaries. Um, <coughs> so if you look at the decisions, these are much simpler to think about because um, each one gets a vote. So e each classifier you get, one, one, one v three, one v two, three v two, they get a vote, basically. And then um, for each box, each part of the, the gene boundary, if you get more votes, you become that class. So in this case, the W doesn't matter as much because each classifier just gets a vote, right? So it's the scale of your W doesn't matter when you do one versus one for linear models. Um, the very interesting thing about this one is the center, which means um, none of them thinks it's the, th it's, it means that it has no class. I mean, everyone gets one vote for each. So in this case, um, how does it so in, in this, so, so it's, it's, if you look at the green and gray line, that's a class, that's a binary classifier between gray and green. So everything above this is gray and the, everything above this is green. So if you look at this one, it says that it is gray, green, and blue. So it, ha it has one vote for each. And so scikit-learn takes the first one that you, that it's the lexicon order of the first one by default. It's, and it's, a, it's because it doesn't have a, everyone gets a vote then you don't, there's no tie, you can't break the tie, you have to break a tie somehow. And by default it takes the first lexicon order. So, which is a very small detail, but um, we have a new feature that allows you to break ties another way, but it's very minute detail. <laughs> um, so if you look at, if you compare one versus rest and one versus one, um, one versus rest trains n classes, um, so you have, Classifiers, so it's, it trains as much classes. It trains that many binary classifier, classifiers. While one versus for one changes, usually trains a lot more because it's, it's a combinatoric. Um, the thing about one versus rest is that um, if let's say you assume your data is balanced, let's say it's one third, one third, one third. Um, one versus rest would or let's make it even drastic, like one ten. Let's say you have ten classes, and then they're balanced. So you have, te te it's 10 percent for each class. If you train a one versus rest, um, you, it's inherently imbalanced because for one versus rest, let's say one versus two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, um, you, you have 10 percent positive class and then 90 percent negative class. So your classifiers have to deal with this thing. Like it's an imbalance. It's 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 imbalanced because like one versus rest is inherently imbalanced if you have if you start out with a balanced data set. All right. Um, for one versus run, if, you, if your data sets are out to be balanced, it's, <coughs> if your data sets are to be balanced, then it's balanced, it's still balanced. Because let's say you have the same, same thing, you have 10 classes, 10% of each one. Um, one versus two will only train on the, the classes that are one and classes that are two. So they are, in, 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 so if your data set started, about, started to be balanced, one versus one would be balanced. So that's the gist of being balanced. Um, there's um, one resource may maintain a, a, a degree of uncertainty because um, the WT pl X plus B term, um, if you do a softmax on that, you get some degree of pro pro um, pro um, probabilities. So um, during remember WT X plus B is any real number. So well, I'm going to talk about the next slide. It looks like so, um, and if you do a softmax on that, you get a number between. Zero and one, and then we're all doing number. All the numbers add up to one. Um, I'm gonna look. I'm gonna look at the softmax in the next slide. So, while one versus one don't have um, uncertainty because it just it's just a binary choice. It's like each binary classifier, classifier just decides zero. Um, uh, it, it gets a vote. So there's no like natural <coughs> way to do probabilities. So we're, I'm gonna talk about the softmax in the next slide, which is um, um, if you want to do um, multi-class classification with logistic regression, um, you would you could train them all together by having a softmax on 
on the decision functions. So in this case, you, um, you, you, this expression here is the softmax. So you, you, you raise all your decision functions to the E, and then you divide by the sum, which means that um, if you sum up all your probabilities, you still get one. And you use this because you're, it's a multi-class problem, which means every single sample has only one class. So you, you softmax it, and it works. It's very natural to do it in, in neural networks. You use this a lot. And um, if you do the multi, uh, maximum likelihood, and then you maximize m the maximum likelihood, and you take the, lo the negative log, you get you know, with that expression, and you, just, you could just optimize this um, directly without doing the, and it's exactly the same as OVR. All right, so we do this um, in scikit-learn automatically. <coughs> so softmax is very good for multi-class classification. Right? It's, it's you, you, put, you put them at the end of the activation layer in neural networks, it's, it's what you do. Uh, yeah, and then you take the argmax of the decision functions to give you the class. So we can finally talk about scikit-learn's API a little bit. Um, um, scikit-learn likes using OVR. The only thing that doesn't use OVR is SVC, which is OVO, because we depend on something called libSVM, and they like using OVO, and so that we use OVO. <laughs> All right, everything else in our library uses OVR. Um, uh, it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's nicer to interpret, and it's, that's what we use. <laughs> Um, the thing yeah. about logistic regression is that it's in the most recent version of logistic regression, we have something, it does auto, so which means that it chooses the correct um, loss function for you. It does everything. It, it chooses multinomial, it chooses multinomial if, you're if, you have mo if it's multi-class classification, um, and it, it does what, what we just said. <laughs> Um, what's interesting about this is that all our linear, model, linear models have some called decision function, which just calculates that, the WTX plus B. And for logistic regression, um, it also does uh, prediction um, we, by calling predict problem. Um, the thing to know about this is that scikit-learn likes outputting, for let's say you train logistic regression on a binary classification. Um, then your, prob your, prob your predict problem will give you n samples by n number of classes, and where the sum of each row is added to one. So that's for multi-class. So if you have three classes, it would be, and like 10 samples would be 10 by three. If, you had, if it's only for binary classification, it would just give you one number, um, because it's, it's, it's giving you the probability of being the positive class. Because, because it, it's redundant to give you the other one because it's just one minus the positive class. So what's like learn if you train your logic regression on a binary classification problem, it would just give you a um, numpy vector of shape of, let's say it's 10, 10 numbers, it'll give you 10 numbers. And just, and that's it, okay? So it's, you're gonna witness it when you train these um, classifications, um, and when you train your classification models. So be careful. Um, Next is that SVC has a probability mode. It, it does, it trains another model on top of the SVC to calibrate. We're gonna get rid of this feature soon, so it's not great, like he said. And so he's gonna talk about better ways to do calibration in the next two lectures. So don't do that, okay? <laughs> sure. Um, next, let's say for if you look at some code, let's say this is the Irish data set, it has four classes, the four flower, four flower types. Um, by the, if you look at the logistic regression, it does, it does that by default mm -hmm. now. It does um, LBFGS, which is a, it's a way to solve um, uh, the optimization problem. It does that by, this by default, and it just, and linear SVM, SVC also, you can also fit, and then the coefficients it gives have different semantics, because logistic regression is multinomial, uh, so in this so in this case for logistic regression it's three by four. There's it's three because <coughs> it's, it's three by four. Four meaning each four meaning there's four features, and then three meaning there's three classes. You see that the bin count there's three classes, and then um, there's four features. So there's one coefficient for each feature, and then since there are three classes, you have three by four, right, yeah? Can I give you a, um, a, a class, a, a string, or it has to be an ordinary 
Um, why is this buzzing? Um, it, it could be a string. It does, um, we do a label encoder that, so you, it, we do encoding on the strings and then there's a buzz. We do encoding on the string and then so you could use strings and it'll work. Like people use this a lot. Like it's, it's kind of weird that it accepts strings as classes, but we, we um, internally we give it an order based on the alphabetical order, the lexicon order of the strings and then we, we do that internally and it works. It's just, so you could use strings as input and people, like, I know someone at Amex that loves this feature, so we're going to keep it forever, I guess. Uh, yeah. Um, how do you get rid of that? Right. Anyways, so if you look, you could, because it's a linear model, you could inspect the coefficients. Oh, I can turn it on. Um, so it's a linear model, so you can inspect the coefficients. Um, you could see that, like, you, you could look at, in this case, um, the data is centered. So, and you could inspect them. It's, it's a linear model. <coughs> so, else? yeah. So let's look at, remember, remember I told you a little bit about, about the solvers? There's many different solvers to solve the logistic regression problem, so many. Um, if you look over here, um, like, you can see this, right? All right, so, like, it's, it's this. There's a lot of solvers. All right, so they're all, they're all, the whole point, the all solvers will come up with the same solution. It's just that some of them are faster and some of them are slower. So sometimes it takes longer to converge for some of these solvers. Um, so he gives you a um, nice little like, tidbits about which one to use <laughs> like, to do um, Andres' experience. Um, some of the things, the tips he gives is that don't use SVC with kernel equal linear, lib linear, use linear SVC which in, like internally uses the liblinear, so that's because it's faster. Yeah. Um, he, this is still in the slides, but um, Lars, um, if you have more features than you have samples, which means you have a very wide data set this way. Um, this is for regression, so why, I don't, it's, it's in my classification slides. Um, um, you use Lars, which is a way, it, it does feature selection very nicely. It, 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 it looks at the correlation between your the feature and your target, and then it does feature selection. Like this is for regression, so it's on. It's in my slides somehow. <laughs> um, if you have n samples, if it's less than uh, ten thousand, then it doesn't matter which solver you use. They all work. Like, th like every so often, there's a new way to do logistic regression, and we just we we have been including them. <laughs> um, for for SVM, the for linear SVM logistic regression, um, if you said. If you have more samples, you have n features, you said do equal to false. Um, if it's the opposite, you said do equal to true. By default, logistic regression is, yeah, it's, 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 it's that. Like, so if you look at the defaults, you can, like, if you don't remember, you can look at the documentation. By default, it's false. So this is a common, and um, so yeah. So this is, this is kind of common. You have more samples and more features, so you, you said do equal to false. So that's by the default. For, um, yeah. Was. If you use the solver equal sag, which is um, stochastic average gradient, um, if your n samples are large, if it's very great, you use statistic gradient descent, which is what neural networks people use nowadays anyway. So if your n samples is very large. All right, so, so, so these are the things that, yeah? Does it make sense to use in grid search uh, use the solver? Oh, grid searching the solver. That's, that's hotly debated. <laughs> Um, because um, there's, it's, yeah, so I won't recommend it because it, it makes the solvers come at, if you pick the correct solver for your data, it will come with a solution faster. It's just, it's, it controls the computation speed. That's the, the solver. Um, it doesn't, so it doesn't, it, yeah, it doesn't make, s sometimes it makes sense to research the solver, but I don't think Andres like, prefers it in general. Uh, Okay. Oof. Forty minutes. Okay. So, uh, yeah. Okay. So next is um, when you talk about SVMs, everyone talks about the kernels. Um, this is. I was writing a grant, um, and I surveyed Nature articles in the last five years for the for the for the giggles, and <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to figure out what scikit-learn modules they use. 
and um, for, for biomedical research, right? This very specific biomedical research or the like clinical research, and like SVMs are still used, like in biology and clinical research. So it's still a thing, right? Even after all this neural network stuff we have, we, people still use this and specific scikit learns version. So it's nice to know what um, what a kernel SVM is as a broad overview. Um, so why you have kernels? Well, the linear models are implicitly they're linear. So they only could um, describe, uh, they only could do classification if your data is linear. Like it's linearly separable as we've seen in the other, all the pictures I've shown you so far. So what the kernels allow you to do is allows you to do, it's kind of like a feature, feature creation with using a kernel. So I'm gonna go through how that, what that looks like with an example. Um, it keeps the complexity of the problem, so it makes it easier to. It still makes it easy. It's still easy to solve. Um, it's almost like neural networks, but neural networks is harder to solve. It's not convex by in general. It's like people create crazy pictures for what the the what the loss function looks like in neural network space because you have so many parameters. So it's 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 a hotly researched topic, and but for SVMs, it's very simple. It's it's everything is still convex, so you can still solve it easily. Um, it's and yeah, so it's almost it's like feature engineering, and I'm gonna give you an example with a polynomial kernel to see what it looks like as feature engineering. So if you look at let's go back to the linear SVM. It's just it's this loss function. It uses the hinge loss. Um, if you want to, it, it pushes things. It has a margin, and it, it, it wants things out of the margin. It, 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 and that's, that's what it does. So if you solve for the Ws, remember the whole goal is to get the Ws and Bs to minimize that expression. Um, you, could, you could reformulate, uh, if, once you solve it that for the Ws, you could rewrite it as a summation of your training data. So in this case, W, which is the thing you solve, could be expressed as a linear combination of all your training data. And the ones that contribute to the loss function, where, where alpha is non-zero, are, are vectors that are considered support vectors. OK? So that's, uh, that's, 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 the awesome, that's the theory behind it. I'm not, I'm not going into the theory too much. But um, if you look at this W as a, as a linear combination, and you plug it into the expression for um, for y, you get this cross product between xt and x, which is your sample. And um, in this case, if you look at this, if there's a if there's a in opposition theory, there's a correlation between. There's a way to think of c with this expression, is that um, c bounds the value of alpha if you get if when you get a solution for alpha, mm -hmm. which means that smaller c's means that your con your contributions of your of your data matters less, so you, you, have, you have so it bounds the weight of every single sample because it's it's a, it's a multiplication, um, which is the same. This is another way to look at C. So it limits the influence. That's Andreas's way to put it. Um, um, yeah. So if you look at the, you see that it only depends on the cross product. So you could um, expand this idea with something called a kernel, where instead of doing the linear kernel, which is just WTX, you could expand this concept with any function, um, in this case, phi, and um, you take the cross product between them. And you could define a function called the kernel. In this case, what this does is that you don't have to define phi. You want to find this you could have these kernels, and as long as they're positive definite and symmetric, that you could, there is, there is a possible phi. So you don't, like, for some kernels, you could have an infinite, an infinitely dimensional phi, and some phi's are, are finite. And some kernels produce a finite phi. What's nice about this is, you could think of, I, I like to think of kernels like the inverse distance. So it's, so kernel right now, it's, it's a similarity. So the, the points that are, close together or most similar, so it has a bigger value for a kernel, and, um, the, which is the inverse of a distance. Like a distance, if points are close together, they're zero, and they're closer far apart, they're, 
there. So this is like the inverse distance. So you're almost you're defining a similarity, a way to measure similarity between points in your data, in your feature space. Okay? That's the gist of kernels. There's many different kernels. There's many different kernels. Um, we've been using the linear kernel, which is WTX. Um, there's the polynomial kernel, which is um, WTX plus C. Um, you can control these parameters in scikit-learn. Um, you could raise it to the power D, which is uh, the power of the, the polynomial. The most popular one people use that I've seen everywhere is um, the radio basis function, which is the radio kernel, radio, the RBF, which is um, which I'll, sh I'll show pictures of how it looks like. So it's it's an exponential. It's very Gaussian. You see that has a hyperparameter gamma. Um, it's and it the gamma value depends on the scale of your training data. So it it directly it's really it, so depending on how you s your data is scaled, um, gamma plays g g gamma the, because gamma is multiplied by your the, the, the norm of your feature space. It matters a lot that you scale your data when you do SVC. Right? That's the gist of it. If you're hyperparameter searching through gamma, which I will show you later, very soon. <laughs> All right. Um, there's other ones that I have not seen ever, <laughs> which is the sigmoid. Um, Kernel and then the, um, this yeah there's, there's other kernels that I don't see being used usually at all. So the nice thing about kernels is that you could like mix and match them. Once you know these are kernels, you can add two kernels and it's, it's, it's a kernel. You could like multiply by a constant as a kernel. You could multiply kernels together. They're kernel. So it's very flexible in how it does feature engineering. Um, yeah. Okay. So for example of a kernel, um, let's let's look at the polynomial kernel. Um, so th the kernel is a trick that was used uh, seven years ago, very popularly, to do s sort of feature engineering. What I mean by this is that, uh, so for a polynomial kernel, let's say if, uh, because I'm uh, expanding, uh, let's say you want to do like five degree polynomial, like that's a lot of polynomial terms in your, <laughs> in your feature space. You, you, because you, every single interaction, you have to raise everything to the fifth, so there's a lot of, so the expansion, when you explicitly expand your feature space with polynomials, it grows very, it, it makes your feature space grow fast. It grows by, um, by the factor of n features to the power of d. But if you use the kernel, all you have to do is um, calculate the kernel for every single pair of samples. So it's n samples by n samples. So it's less computation expensive in this case, in some cases, when you answer, which I'll show you soon. Um, if you look at what the features look like for the polynomial kernel um, for d equal to 2, in this case, the, um, the feature space is finite. And so if you want to, if you want to use a linear SVC and um, you want to use a polynomial kernel, it's the same as using a linear SVC with feature expansion um, with, uh, where's my mouse? Oh, like so, like here. So in this case, for your feature, you square it, you multiply by square root of two, and then you put a, and you don't actually have to put the one. But so in this case, you, you create new features. Um, I'm gonna show you how it looks like in scikit-learn. Um, so if you look at, so in this case, this thing over here, this parentheses, that's your phi. So phi t times phi gives you the kernel, right? So this, this, for this example, it works out that um, for the polynomial kernel, there's a finite way to write your file. Um, what does it look like in scikit-learn? It's something called polynomial features. In this case, you have <coughs> you have two features, and then you can expand it into its polynomial coefficients. So you could have x0, x1, which is the original features, x0 squared, which is the, the second degree, the interaction term, x0, x1, and then x1 squared. So these are your polynomial features. And if you put that through a linear SVC, um, which is the right-hand side, um, you, it gives you that decision boundary. And if you just use the current, if you just use um, SVC with the radio with the polynomial kernel of degree two, you get something on the left. So you you get similar results. The big the big difference where the results are different is that um, you see that the poly, when you use polynomial features in scikit-learn, it doesn't include that square root of two. So they're not going to be exact. 
That's the big, the big difference. Because um, if you actually want to do the polynomial kernel, you have to add the square root of 2 next to it. So cyclone doesn't add like random constants when you use polynomial features. <laughs> yeah. So that's the linear. That's the kernel. Um, now, now, how do you interpret the kernel? What, what is these? Like, so when you train the linear SV, SVM, you get different coefficients. So let's say, let's look back at, so the linear SVM is the linear support vector machine trained on polynomial features. You get, some, you get coefficients, which in this case, since it's training a linear SVM, it, um, if you want to write out the decision function of this thing, you just take your, um, each coefficient and multiply it by the, the feature. So in this case, you have these numbers, and the features are these over here, the x0, x1, x0 squared, and so forth. You see it's the same thing here. x0, x1, x0 squared, x0, yeah. so it's, it's just the coefficient in front of these polynomial features. Right? If you look at, <coughs> another way to write them is because it's um, support vec, um, you could write them as, if you could write them as, You could, you could use, so the dual coefficients are the coefficients in front of this, this, this thing over here, this alpha. These are dual coefficients. And so when you, saw, when you train your model, scikit-learn uses the underscore to denote that these are trained attributes. Um, you, so it also gives you the dual coefficients. In this case, those numbers right there, 0 0.03. And it also gives you what vectors are support vectors. So another way to write this result is as a, in terms of, you can write it as, in terms of the feature, the, the kernel. In this case, remember the kernel was this thing. Right? This is phi of x. So in this case, if you want, so these are the same exact solutions. Um, what, what's, what's interesting about here is that this phi of x1 is a training data set, so that's known. And um, if you want to like, insert a new data set, a, a, a test data point, like a test sample, you put it through 5x, and then you do a cross product, and then you do the summation, and then you get your prediction. So this is not the most common way to write this, because most kernel, like the kernel, the, the most popular kernel people use is the RBF, which, which, which means you can't feature expand it. It's like, it's, um, if you want to expand it, it would be an infinite, um, it would be infinite dimensional. There'd be, there's no way to finally write the, this phi this, this phi thing, oh my god, here, phi for the radial basis kernel. So one of the ways people commonly write this thing is if you look at the, if, so remember we trained one with a polynomial SVM? Uh, you could write this as a summation of the kernels, like, like this. So, which is the way I normally write this thing. So you have the dual coefficients as well, and then you have the support, the support vectors, and then you have the kernel. So you write them as um, a summation of the things in the kernel. Um, yeah. So now, when you train a kernel, a kernel is n samples by n samples. So for, when you have small number of samples, okay, so okay, the t the t this is the runtime, this is how long it takes to run your training data, your training. On the x-axis is the time it takes to train. On the, on the, the y-axis is the time it takes to train. The so x-axis is the number of samples you have. Now, um, the top is linear, and the bottom is the log of that. So it's, this, it's, just, it's the same plot, but different scale, all right? So if you look at the kernel, the kernel one is faster when you have small number of samples, and it, it's horrible when you have a lot of samples. Because calculating n samples by n samples is create is it's a lot of work. <laughs> when like, it's, it's 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 like a distance matrix like, by reverse. It's a similarity matrix. So you want to calculate one number for every two points in your training set, and that gets very long. It takes a long time to do that when you have a lot of samples. So that's you can run into this a lot when you do like KNN stuff. Like KNN's neighbors also run into this problem because you have n samples to n samples, and that takes a long time when you have lots of samples. So this is, okay. Um, so, but it's faster when it's small. As, as you see that um, when n samples is less than 10 to the third, then the kernel is faster. Now, um, why do you use kernels? Um, 
then? Well, th there's, okay, what does kernels look like in practice? Um, there's um, dual, the, duals, the dual coefficients are less interpretable. Remember, they're the, they're the dual coefficients represent the, co the coefficient in front of the, the, support, the support vector, and that may mean something. Um, it's very bad for large samples, like as you've seen like, on, this, on this picture. Um, it, the really cool thing about them is that they have, um, they have infinite differential spaces, like RBFs are called the universal kernel, yeah, you wrote them, which means that it could almost fit everything, and it does fit everything. And the linear, so, and the linear kernel is very, it's very restrictive, and it's how it fits, because it, it just does a hyperplane, and that's it. But the radio basis um, function could fit anything, which we'll, which we'll see in a, in, the, in a few slides. So in practice, um, what is important, especially when you use the radio basis function, is that the, you have pre-processing. Because the kernel in calculates a sort of a, um, a similarity, between, similarity between two, few, um, two vectors in your, in your training set. And um, remember that gamma is multiplied by the distance. So you should have, you should 100% always scale your data before you put it through SVM. Um, yeah, and ga gamma parameter in the SVM, the SVC in scikit-learn, it, it does magic, it, it does the scaling for you inside too. So it, it does, it, it, it helps you out a bit. <laughs> so it, it's, yeah, so that was. Yeah, so let's, if you look at different um, radio basis functions. Um, there's two regularization parameters. There's the C, and there's a C, and then now there's a gamma for radio basis functions. Um, for gamma, if you look at this graph for gamma, gamma being big means that your uh, on the on the x-axis is the difference, is the absolute value squared, is the, the absolute value, and on um, the y-axis is the kernel, the function itself. So if two points are really close together, it's always one. <laughs> because th that means they're very similar. It's exactly the same point, they're very similar. But as you move away from each other, um, for big gamma, the, which is the gray line in the middle, which, which you can't really see, um, then um, points that are not too far, um, the similarity reaches zero really quickly. So for very small gamma, let's say 0 0.0001, points that are Farther away are considered similar. So this, this is a, so. So then they call it more broad. So bigger, smaller gamma means that the kernel is more broad. So what does that look like in practice when you do decision boundaries, decision functions for um, SVCs using radio basis functions? Well, um, this is a plot. This is many different radio basis functions um, where. C increases as you go to the um, down. C increases as you go down, and gamma increases as you go right. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, so the least there's least amount. So when C is small, there's a lot of regularization, and when gamma is small, there's not. It's on on the okay. So on the top left, it's the least overfit, and on the bottom. Right is the most of a fit, as you see that. Um, so let, let's look, let's only look at one column for now. Let's look at the first column, the first column, over here, and go straight down. So this is um, you have a decision boundary here. As you increase C, um, the thing cur occurs more because um, points have it really wants to create a boundary that separates that separates the points better. Um, in this case, you see that there's a blue point here, which is classified wrong. As you increase C, it wants, it just really wants to um, take this point into consideration. Because remember, the C is in front of that summation thing. So that, so, so if this, this right now, if, if C is small, the loss, the loss contributed by this point is not that great. But once C is big, the loss contributed by this point is really big. So it really wants to get it right. So that's, that's the idea between, behind C. So, but by getting it right, I mean that it draws a line so that it, it, it caters to this point a lot more as you increase C. So that's, that's, all, that's increasing C. Um, increasing gamma, um, 
makes it so that remember increasing gamma means that the radio function gets narrower. So it means that points that are close apart, only points that are really close apart are considered similar. And so as you consider, as you incre let's look at the first row, as you increase gamma, um, um, the, the, cost of the decision boundaries get more, decision boundaries get more, like they isolate every point. So it's very, sh like once you increase gamma to a certain point, you get something like this for your rate-based function, which I, I would say it's, over, it's overfit badly because like I would say the like points over here would be red, but in this case, it's blue. <laughs> So, so yeah. So that's the. As it's, it's it's very. If you look at the pictures, it's very straightforward what it does. The gamma likes putting things in circles. Um, C likes to curve the decision function so that it incorporates more points into. It, it, it wants to get more points right. So that's the give and take between them. Um, you could grid search them, which I'll show you next. Um, you have. Let's. Have you seen this data set before? That the digits data set. It's like eight by eight digits that people used to use in like the 1980s for zip codes, and it's in scikit-learn. They're very, it's a very simple data set. Um, this is a slide I changed a bit. Um, so for SVCs, there's a lot of code here now, look at it. Um, for SVCs, remember you have to scale them. Who, who's familiar with make pipeline, or pipelines in general in scikit-learn? So um, pipelines allow you to scale your data um, by, by, by in this case, it's, it allows you to um, pipe different transformations, and then at the end, you could classify something. So you could transform your data however you want, and at the end, you do a classification problem in this case. So in this case, this make pipeline thing, um, the first thing it does is scales your data, and then it puts it through SVC. Um, and by default, uh, by default, SVC has gamma mean scale, which gives you a good, a good classification score, because by default, it uses n features, uh, we use one divided by n features divided by the variance, which um, it, it kind of does the scaling internally. So it, it gives you a very nice result. It's very similar to scaling it myself. Okay? So it's, and if you do the, if you put the gamma in manually, um, it gives you exactly the same result as um, SVC with scale, because it does the scaling internally. <laughs> so, so if you're, yeah. So if you want to grid search through them, um, in this case, there's two parameters. Um, there's a lot more, but um, the two we focus on in this lecture is C and gamma. Um, um, in this case, we're searching through the log space between negative three and two. And for gamma, we're also distributing through the log space. But since we're searching through the scale, this, this uh, so this thing, um, scaled SVC, is the pipeline. So as soon as we're searching through that, we, have a, we use a gamma that is log scaled, but divided by the number of features because we're putting it through the scaled version. Um, so in this case, you have these hyperparameters um, th that we can search through. And if you do s the grid search on this, who's familiar with the grid search? I think he went over it a lot. Yeah. I just love grid search. Um, you, you fit, and then you could plot the heat map of this thing. Um, the cool, the interesting thing about the, you can see a few things about the accuracy in this case. Um, you'll learn more about metrics soon. <laughs> um, in this case, um, by default, scikit-learn uses accuracy, so which may or may not be a good me metric depending on your what, you, what your business problem is. Um, uh, don't use always use accuracy, but in this case, we use accuracy. And um, the dark purple version region is zero, and the big yellow versions are one. Um, so in this case, you see that for certain hyperparameters, um, you get, um, well, the, the big power version is 0 0.2. And since the 10 digit problem is 10 digits, if you don't do any model, you predict 20%. Like you, you predict, <coughs> so, okay, so in this case, here is 10%. So if you don't train anything, you get, a very, you get an accuracy of 10%, which is just predicting random, like, it's, predict, it, it's not doing anything but the baseline. It does nothing on the, on the side. But on this side, it predicts something very close to one. And so um, this means that hyperparameters are important. Uh, so um, what else is there? If you look at this thing, can you see that it's kind of like green? 
and this segment is bright yellow, and this is the test, this is the train accuracy, and this is the test accuracy. So that means that over here, which is large gamma and large C, it means it overfit because over here um, you have a great, you have a very good you have a training accuracy that is greater than the testing accuracy, and which makes sense because remember large gamma and large C results in something like this, which is overfit, which is overfit. <laughs> so yeah, um, another thing that Andreas likes about heat maps is that you can see that um, if you want to continue doing grid search. There's no point of searching here anymore. Like, there's no point of searching through this space on top because they're all um, low accuracy. But over here, you see that they have high, high accuracy. There's, there may be a point of searching down on this boundary, even lower than this. So, so the heat map tells you this type of information, and Andreas likes that the heat map tells you this information. There's a lot, there's a, there's a lot of ways to plot grid search results, and the for it, when you're grid searching, do two hyperparameters. He he likes doing heat maps, and this is the insight he gets from heat maps. <coughs> yeah, right. um, that's linear models and SVMs. Thanks for coming. I think I won't do that quick. I have ten more minutes. You have any questions? Yeah. You want to talk about as I get learn things? <laughs> yeah. Oh, minus one and one. I, I, me personally, I always use one and zero. Um, um, the one and negative one bit is because historically they all like, when, when people were developing support vector machines, they like using one and negative one. And um, if you look at the expression here, it makes that expression look slightly nicer if you use one and negative one. But if you use one and zero, it's a slightly bigger. So it's, it's the same thing, right? But when you're reading something, you have to make sure what, um, what they're using because it's a very different result. Like if, if this is right now, I'm assuming yi is one or negative one, right? So if it's one and zero, this would be wrong, right? So you have to make sure when you're reading any textbook, you know which one they're using. So like it's, it's, there's no good reason why. It's just some people use one negative one, some people don't. Huh? You want to see it? <laughs> I could do it on the board. I can't do it here, but okay. Uh. Uh, uh, uh. Wait, let me let me stop the recording first. <laughs> <laughs>